Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, Mile. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us today for this webinar on connecting with your client, which is, I, I believe, one of the most important things we can do in business going forward in, in this new millennium, where I think there's been a real significant shift in the way business is conducted. And I think, you know, a few years ago we would hear this saying, and, and I think probably everybody's familiar with it, maybe you've heard five times, maybe ten times, that it costs five times or ten times more to acquire a customer than it does to retain one. And as I, I just want to start out here and say, you know, we'll, we'll talk for about uh, half an hour, 45 minutes, and then open it up for questions. But I want to start out with this statement to say, this is false. This is a false statement. And it comes from an old way of thinking about business. And, and the way that we used to think about business is really rooted in the industrial era. And the question that I would ask is you consider that statement that it costs five times more to acquire a customer than it does to retain one, I guess we would have to ask ourselves this question. Do we sell our customers what we have, or do we sell our customers what they need? And I think answering this question will determine whether that first statement is true or false. If we're selling them what we have, then probably it is true that it's going to cost us more to acquire a customer than it is to retain one. But if we are really focused on understanding what our customer needs and ensuring that we are delivering solutions to those needs, then there's probably some investment that's going to be required on our side. And, and depending on the nature of the relationship, that investment may dwarf the investment that we made to acquire the customer in the first place. But the payoff will also be significant. And I think this, this way of thinking that it costs more to acquire a customer than it does to retain one is, as I said earlier, it is rooted in the industrial age. And the industrial age really was, was born because of our, the invention of the steam engine. When we were able to harness the power of steam, and suddenly that gave us access to incredible power. And much of that power was used to create factories. And in these factories, then, we really discovered the magic and the economics, or maybe the economic magic, of economies of scale. So that the more we produced, the cheaper it was to produce whatever it was, you know, widgets, uh, whatever it was we were producing, these products, uh, the more we produced, the bigger our factories were, the more production there was, the cheaper was the cost. And so that was the, the route to profitability. Now, all of that changed <clears throat> in 1991 because of this gentleman primarily. That in 1989, Tim Berners-Lee, I should say Sir Tim Berners-Lee, wrote a proposal to the government about how computers could be connected and use a technology called hypertext to enable users to browse and gain access to information. And you know, there's a saying, information is power. And, and there's a truth to that, that because of what Sir Tim Berners-Lee introduced with the World Wide Web, customers have access to unprecedented amounts of information. And not only that, they have access to choice. So I'm here in Canada presenting to business executives in the Middle East. Prior to the internet, this, this would have been unheard of. But now business is global information is easily accessible, and power has shifted from the seller to the buyer. And the buyer's demands now matter. In a mass production economy, the buyer has to make sacrifices. The buyer basically has to buy what's available. And if it doesn't quite fit perfectly, oh well, that's too bad. That's a sacrifice that we have to make, and we buy it anyway. In a world where power has shifted to the buyer, the buyer is now unwilling to make sacrifices if the buyer has choice. And the buyer's choices now span the globe. The buyer can look all over the world with a single mouse click and buy from almost anybody to ensure that his or her needs are specifically met. It, it's taking us back now to the age before the steam engine. It's taking us back to the age of the craftsman, 
who had a relationship with his customers and who really understood his customers and, and understood the specific needs and idiosyncrasies of each customer and could even anticipate the customer's needs. So if I had a customer, if I was a shoemaker and, and you were one of my customers, not only maybe you know one foot might be slightly larger than the other, and I would understand that, and I would make the shoes accordingly, but maybe you have a family. Maybe you've just had a young baby, and I know that in a matter of nine or ten months, that baby's going to be walking, and it's going to need shoes, and I can anticipate your needs because of the relationship that we have, because I actually understand you and know you as a human being. All of that was lost with the introduction of the steam engine and the introduction of mass production, but it's coming back now with the advent of the World Wide Web and, and, and the power that has shifted to the buyers and the fact that buyers are now unwilling to sacrifice or they're less willing to sacrifice if their needs are not being met specifically. So that's putting pressure on us as suppliers to make sure that we meet the demands of our customers. And now the question is, you know, which customers do we actually want to meet, to meet the demands of it? If customers are becoming more demanding, do we want every possible customer we can have and then have these customers pulling us in different directions? Or do we maybe want to define what an ideal customer looks like for us and then put parameters around that to say, okay, here are some uh, compromises we're willing to make in terms of who we do business with, and so we can define a right fit customer within the context of an ideal customer. And then anybody who's not a right fit customer, we either don't do business with them or we do business with them in a very uh, aware way where we're not, we're not going to be making further investments for them because there's no payoff. But for our right fit customers, we will make investments and we will make sacrifices in order to grow and develop and build new products for them. Adrian Slavatsky, in a book called The Profit Zone, talks about the modern value chain. And he says it's completely reversed from everything we've ever known about value in business. In the past, value, the fundamental basis of value, was our assets. We basically, on the balance sheet, <coughs> excuse me, on the balance sheet, we had land, we had e buildings, and we had equipment inside those buildings. And that was, that was our power. And based on that land and the buildings on it and the equipment inside it, we would then purchase raw materials. We would put those raw materials through a mass production process. We would produce products. We would develop channels to get those products to market. And then we would get those products in, in the hands of the customer. In fact, we didn't even call them customers back then. We just called them markets. So we would get our, our products into market. And that was, the, moder that was the, the value chain in the past. What Adrian Slavatsky argues is that today, value has done a complete 180. And it doesn't end with the customer. It starts with the customer. And that the real definition of value is not in your land, building, and equipment. It is actually in your understanding of your customer. How well do you understand your customer? How well do you understand the criteria that they use to make their decisions? How well do you understand what frustrates them or even angers them? Because if you understand that, that is a huge source of value. That is a huge competitive advantage that you will have over everybody else who's trying to win that customer. If you actually understand their emotional makeup, do you understand their preferences? Do you understand how they exercise their power? Do you actually understand the process of decision making? Do you understand your customer at the level where they, they make their decisions and how they make their decisions and who gets involved and, and when they get involved? Do you understand the occasion for the purchase? That there are certain triggers that cause these customers to buy. How well do you understand those triggers? How well do you understand how the buyer behaves? And, and then you know, do you understand the actual functional need that your product or your service is satisfying. Adrian Slavatsky argues that if you're going to be profitable today, this is where you have to begin. Once you've decided then who your customer is and you understand who your customer is, 
then you can decide what are the best channels for us to use to reach this customer. Now that we actually understand this human being and how they live and how they work and how they play and where they live and where they work and where they play, now we can figure out what are the best channels to reach them. Once we've figured that out, then we need to figure out how do we develop our products or our services, how do we package our products or services to, to be optimized in these channels to reach our customer. Then based on how we've designed our offerings, we then figure out the inputs. Where do we actually get the raw materials? Which raw materials do we actually need to develop these products for these channels for this customer? And only then do we decide, okay, which assets do we really need? Do we actually need land? Do we actually need buildings? Do we actually need equipment? What, what are the proper investments that we should be making on the asset side? So that actually comes last. And what comes first in the modern value chain is our understanding of the customer. And so that means that those resources that we have that actually interact with the customer become our most strategic sources of value. And I'm speaking now specifically of our account managers, of our salespeople. That in the old world where we begin with assets and end with the customer, the salesperson is really a tactical resource. It, it's their job to get the product into the hands of the customer. So we have a, a sales conference, we fly the salespeople in, and we spend one day, two days, three days, five days educating the salesperson on our new products, on our capabilities, why we're better than the competition, why our, why, our, why our products or services are so great, and then we send them out into the world to go and educate the customer. Well, that is a misuse of a very strategic resource in a world where value begins with the customer. So I'd like to propose that we look at our relationships with our customers from their perspective. And from their perspective, the relationship actually has a life cycle. It has five stages that it goes through as it matures. You know, from the mass production world, we basically had two stages, with our prospects and there were customers. And we sent salespeople into the world to convert these prospects into customers. Now that information is so accessible and power has shifted to the buyer, now the buyer's perspective actually matters. And we need to look at our relationships from the buyer's perspective. And that means that those people that we're looking out in the world as our prospects, when they're looking at us, they don't see us as prospects. or They don't see themselves as prospects. They simply see us as a stranger. They're doing millions of dollars of business, in some cases billions of dollars of business every year. They're just not doing it with us, and they don't know who we are. And the fact that we want to approach them, you know, that, that doesn't mean anything to them. And so, if anything, it causes anxiety. You know, why are you phoning me? Why are you emailing me? I don't know who you are. Um, I, I don't like when strangers pursue me. If we are successful in converting a prospect to a customer, from the customer's perspective, that's just not true. We, we haven't converted them. They've converted us. They're the ones that got to know us, got to like us, got to trust us, and decided that we could do business with them. And they converted us from a stranger to a supplier. Now, in the old world, we would say the business is closed, and that has a ring of finality to it. Our work is done. Salesperson move on, get another customer and that's where our cost of acquisition is. But in this world, where we're looking at it from the buyer's perspective, becoming a supplier is really next to nothing. Uh, buyers change their suppliers like they change their clothes. It, it's a transactional relationship, and, and you're in a very vulnerable position if all you are is a supplier. You, you deliver a good or a service, and I pay you for it. But there, you're, there's somebody knocking on my door the same day offering practically the same service or the same product. So the next stage from the buyer's perspective is for you to become a desired supplier. And that word desired is important 
it's an emotional word. It means that now this relationship has become emotional. There's something about what you supply, and more importantly, how you supply it, how you deliver on your promises, that makes me want to do business with you. And this is often when you get the question from the buyer, what else do you guys do? I'm, I'm curious. I, I like this relationship. I like the way you guys deliver. And so I want to broaden the amount of work that you do with us. As a supplier, you're often, it's the salesperson talking to the purchasing, the buyer, whoever that decision maker is. When you get to desired supplier stage, it no longer is it a one-to-one -one relationship. It becomes a many-to-many -many relationship. The doors swing wide open, and many people in your organization are able to talk to many people in the buyer's organization. This we call the desired supplier. But the relationship doesn't end here. In fact, this is really the pivot point from, from moving from a tactical relationship to a strategic one. And the beginning of a strategic relationship is when you're perceived by your buyer as a trusted advisor. A trusted advisor is different from a supplier because the emphasis is no longer on what I call content. Content is anything that has to do with your expertise. This is your content expertise. A trusted advisor shifts from expertise in content to expertise in context. Context I define as anything to do with my business. If I'm your buyer, if I'm your customer, the more knowledge and expertise you have in my business, I call that context. And this is the trusted advisor has context, and that's what enables me or inspires me to turn to you as my trusted advisor. That's where I reach out to you and I, I want to know what you think. I'm facing a particular challenge. What do you think about this? And I really value what you have to say because of your understanding of my context, of my business. The ultimate level of relationship with the buyer, with the, with the customer, is what we call the strategic ally or the symbiotic partner. And this is where you're really no longer a supplier. You're truly a partner in this sense. Even a trusted advisor is, in, in a sense, seen as a supplier in, in the sense that they're in the supply chain. They supply something to me. And in addition to what they supply, they also provide advice, which is what makes them different from a regular supplier. But they supply something to me, and I transform it in some way, and I then supply value to my customer. A strategic ally is different. With a strategic ally, I actually partner with my customer. And they expose to me their customer. And so together, we collaborate to create new value for their customer. So their customer, in a sense, becomes my customer in the context of the relationship that I have with my main customer. But, but they really are becoming much more transparent with me and sharing with me the challenges of the end customer so we can co-create value for the end customer. So this type of thinking now takes effort. And this is where I challenge that statement that it costs five times more to acquire a customer than it does to retain one. Well, you know, getting from a stranger to a supplier, yes, there is a lot of cost there. But to go from a supplier to a strategic ally, I propose or I submit that there's even more cost involved in doing that. And you need to be careful then about who you let into your customer community. And, and when you do let them in, to decide, are we satisfied with a supplier relationship here? They just see us as a supplier. It's a transactional relationship. We could lose them tomorrow. Is that OK? It might be for some customers. They're, they're, they're just not a good match for you, but it keeps the lights on. In other cases, you may say, you know what? This is a perfect customer for us. And we need to work as hard as we can and invest what we can to move this relationship up to a trusted advisor or strategic alliance. Now, often the 80-20 rule kicks in here, where 80% of your customers are going to see you as a supplier, and that's it. And 20% are going to see you as strategic to their business. But that 20% will generate 80% of your profit. And, and they, that 20% that has some other meaning for you as well. And that relates to what I call the enterprise life cycle. So first we were looking at 
how your customer perceives you. Now we want to look at your business and the impact that your, that your customer relationships can have on your business. In, in this sense now, when we look at any business, every business, no matter how large, didn't exist at one time. And it, it came into existence through the mind of a human being. Somebody had an idea that this is a way we could create value for the market. And so a business was born. And we call this the entrepreneurial stage. Most businesses fail. Most entrepreneurs fail. They don't, they don't go past five years. I think 80% of small businesses fail within the first five years. So this is a very, very difficult undertaking. And if you look at the graphic underneath where this, this circle represents your business, the solid circle represents your customers, and the solid dot represents your focus. The entrepreneurial company is very focused on each and every customer that they have. And whatever the customer asks them to do, they'll, they, the answer is always yes. You know, we could be a software company, but the company asks, well, you know, do you guys wash windows? The answer is always yes. If there's money involved, because a, an entrepreneurial company is so cash starved, that they, they'll, they'll pr pretty much say yes to everything. Once they begin to find traction, they begin to really figure out what they're in business to do. They move away from trying to satisfy every single customer, where you see the dot here move to the middle, where they're now satisfying a market. They understand the market that they're in business to serve, and they begin to say no. You know, if I'm a software developer, and the company's asking me if I wash windows, the answer is no, we don't wash windows. But let's talk about your software needs. Or more specifically, let's talk about your supply chain needs, or your CRM needs, or your ERP needs. So at this stage, they become a toddler. They begin to find their legs. And they begin to attract other people who share their vision. The challenge with the entrepreneurial company was cash, not understanding how, how much cash is needed to run a business. And so they don't have enough runway to get off the ground. They, they die from starvation. The challenge with the performing enterprise is workload, that there are a few key people who really get it, and they run hard and they run fast. But that's the problem. There's only a few key people. And they're so good at what they do, it's actually easier for them to do everything themselves than it is to try to train others. And so the business is not able to grow beyond them, and they fail at this stage because of what I would call indigestion. So first we die from starvation, then we die from indigestion. So, so the more successful we become, the more at risk we are of failing. We, we actually fail under the weight of success. We just stretch our people too thin, they burn out. If a critical person leaves, it, it could be catastrophic or fatal to the company. In order for the company to continue to grow past success, this, this early success, it has to become systematic. It has to start laying down some policies, some procedures, some processes, some systems, putting in some structure. This is the only way it can become scalable. And with this structure, with these systems, with these processes and policies, they are now able to scale. They're able to replicate. And, and as you'll see here, the, the focus goes inside. We, we've got demand. We've got customers. We've got markets that we sell to. In a sense, we have to take all of that for granted in order to start putting in the systems and processes that we need. And often, in order to do this, this is such a giant leap to go from performing to systematic, that the founding employee, founder and the founding employees, the first employees, they are more entrepreneurial in nature and in spirit. They're not able to do this. And so as a result, they, they hire people to come in and do this for them. And these are people with, with tremendous track record. They've worked for the large companies. They work for uh, Procter & Gamble, General Motors, General Electric. They work for these big companies. And so they know all about processes and procedures and policies. And, they've got a, and, and they're now interested in the smaller company because of its success and, and the rate of success. They come in and they start to put in these policies and procedures. And that creates conflict. And often, so much so, that the founder and the founding employees are forced out. They are too undisciplined. They are too wild for, for the new world. 
and they have no credibility. All the chaos that, that these, new, that these um, I call them professional managers, are trying to stamp out, the authors of that chaos are the entrepreneurs. And, and when the professional managers say, this is the form that needs to be filled out before you can do whatever it is you want to do, the entrepreneurs resent that. They, they like the, the good old days when we could just shoot from the hip and do what we want. And so a lot of conflict uh, is, ensues at this stage, and often the, the entrepreneurial company, uh, employees are forced out. If that happens, these companies die. These companies die at the systematic stage because of this new world that we're in, where understanding the customer and how the customer's world is changing is the secret to value. In the old industrial age, this is all we needed to do is get to systematic and enjoy economies of scale because demand was, was static. Demand was constant. It didn't change that much. In today's world where it's changing every day, our, our customers are being impacted by uh, geographical issues, the, uh, climate change, economic issues, technological issues, wars. The world is very unstable. And, and, and every time our customer's world changes, their perception of value changes. And systematic managers, professional managers, don't understand this. They're administrators. They're not entrepreneurs. And so administrators lose that ability to innovate. And they die. In order to continue, they have to put in these systems and processes, but they also have to remain entrepreneurial. They need that entrepreneurial spirit to remain in the company. And in fact, most companies that go through this stage, the founder stays with them. And, and even if you think of Apple where you know, they lost Steve Jobs for a while, and, and it was run by administrators, and it started to decline. It started to die until Steve Jobs came back and breathed the spirit of innovation back into the company without, while respecting system, systematization. And so we call this stage adaptive where we put our systems in place, but we begin to look back out to the market and try to prioritize what the market needs and how the market is changing. And the entrepreneurs and the professional managers respect each other. We need processes, we need policies, we need procedures, but we also need innovation because the definition of value, the perception of value keeps changing. And then finally, the highest stage or the most mature stage is what we call preemptive where we have mastered the ability to change as an organization. And we respect administration, but we also expect, uh, respect innovation. And we've learned how to work these two sides together because they're two sides of the same coin. When we get there, then we can become preemptive. And by preemptive, I mean anticipatory. We can anticipate where value is going. Why? Because we know who our best customers are. And we've separated that 20% of customers who generate 80% of our profitability from the 80% that you know, maybe even cost us money. Now we're focusing on our ideal customer or our right fit customer. And we really get in and understand them. And it's our salespeople that do that for us. It's our account managers that do that for us. Get in and really understand the customer and see how the customer's world is changing. And come back and tell us. Instead of us having conferences where you, we tell you what our new products are and then you tell the customer, no, we're going to turn this around. You live with the customer. You get to really understand the customer. And then come and tell us how the customer's world is changing, how their perception of value is changing. And that way we can change the rules of the game. We can bring new value to the market and leave our competitors in the dust. The, the real magic of understanding these two life cycles is when we put them together. So along the horizontal axis is this move from an entrepreneurial company to a preemptive one. And on the vertical axis is where our relationships move from us being total strangers to having customers that now see us as strategic partners. Well, that creates four quadrants when we put these two life cycles together. And it is this first quadrant that I call the winner's quadrant. This is where we want to be, where we have figured out how to build strategic relationships with our best customers. And because of the nature of those relationships, we get access to preferential information or, or 
uh, I could call private information, information that our competitors don't have because they don't have the intimacy that, that we have with our customers. With that information, we are able to innovate. And that's where, again, I challenge that statement that it costs five times more to acquire a customer than it does to retain one. Well, no, that's not true. Because today, in order to retain a customer, we have to change. If the customer's world is changing and their perception of value is changing, then we can't just keep doing the same old, same old and think that, that the customer is going to be happy. They're going to move on. So in order to retain this customer, we have to understand how their world is changing. And then we need to figure out, based on these new challenges that they're facing, how do we innovate? What investments do we have to make in order to create new value for this customer? This is the winner's quadrant. This is where, as long as we're doing that, we will never fail. It's when we stop doing that that we fail. The lower left-hand quadrant I call the loser's quadrant. This is the quadrant where we just, we're not valuable to our, to our customers. They see us as suppliers. The reason they do business with us is because they can get something from us two cents cheaper. Or, or they can get something from us where we'll throw in free services. And, and none of our competitors will do that. So there, it's a bargain. It's an economic equation. They don't care what the cost is to us. And, and we haven't figured out how to move beyond systematization. So, so we have a high cost structure. And, and we can't change. We can't innovate. And so this is the loser's quadrant. This quadrant here, this third quadrant, is interesting. I call it the legend's quadrant. And this is where we actually have figured out how to provide strategic value to our customers. And they value us strategically. We just haven't figured out how to innovate. We, we are, we're a one-trick pony. This is what we do. And while we do it, everybody loves us. But the minute their, the customer's world changes, and it can change overnight, and their perception of value changes, Whatever it was we were doing is no longer valuable. We built our company around a product. We believed it's five times more expensive to acquire a customer than it is to, to, to retain one. So our, our concept of retention is same old, same old, not realizing that the customer's perception of value has changed and, and that we're no longer valuable to them. So this is where you hear companies talk about the good old days. Remember when. And then all the best people leave and go somewhere else. And then finally, this quadrant in the lower right, I call them myths. These are large companies that at one point, they were winners. They were making the right strategic moves, but they stopped. They became complacent. They became arrogant. And they're so big, they think they're too big to fail. And, and, and they're so big that the CEO and the senior executives are powerful. And nobody will speak truth to power. Pa power won't listen. And, and nobody's going to come and tell the, 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 the CEO that their baby is ugly. And so they, they, they continue in this mythology of how great they are. The reason often they can do this is because they have some sort of artificial protection. Maybe if you think, you know, here in the West we have um, uh, telecommunications firms that will lock people in for three years. So I have a provider that I get my cell phone service from, but I'm locked into them for three years. And if I get a new device, then I sign another agreement that says I'm locked in for another three years. Now, if we went month to month, then they would know whether or not I'm a loyal customer. I've been with this provider for 12 years. And in their books, I'm considered a loyal customer. I'm not a loyal customer. I'm a captive customer. I'm held captive. If I had a choice, I wouldn't do business with them. But I'm locked in. I keep having to renew these three-year contracts because uh, the other provider is not any better. But if there was true freedom in the market and people could really provide innovative value, I don't think I'd be with this, this provider. I don't think they're, 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 they're that great. So this is the quadrant of deception. Losers is the quadrant of poverty. Legends is the quadrant of seduction. You think you're doing something great. And winners is the quadrant of prosperity. This is where we need to be in order to be prosperous in this new business world. We need to have salespeople, account managers that have strategic relationships or that can quarterback and lead strategic relationships with customers. And we need to make the, the necessary investments in innovation 
in order to remain relevant, ongoingly relevant to these customers. Every company, regardless of size or market or location, will experience this curve. The challenge is when they're on the upside of it, they believe that they are somehow immune to this curve and they will always be going up. It's just not true. So if we look at profitability over time, when you get it right, when you're in that legends quadrant, you're gonna, you're, your profit is going up and up. The problem with profit is it's what we call a lagging indicator. It tells you that you were doing something great yesterday or last quarter or last year. It looks back. In a world that's rapidly changing, profit is no indicator of future success. Profit is an indicator of past success. And so what happens when people look at profitability is, is if you look at these two lines, the, the line going up shows readiness for change. When, when things are going well, when we're looking at the income statement and profit is coming in, nobody wants to change. We like what we have and we will defend it. So if anybody suggests change, we become upset and defensive. On the other hand, if you look at the line going down, this represents our ability to change. Our strategic capability to change is highest when profit is coming into the company. We've got the best employees. We can hire even better employees. We've got great investors behind us. We've got customers that love us. This is, the ability, this is when we have the greatest ability to make changes. But because people in the organization are unwilling to make changes, we don't. If, when we get to the tail end of the profit curve, where profit is leaving the company, and the best employees are leaving, and the best customers are leaving, and investors are losing confidence, this is when we don't have the ability to change. We lose our ability to change. But this is when readiness for change is highest. This is when everybody realizes, OK, we're in crisis. And so that's what we call crisis change. So your business has to change. It, it cannot stay the way it is today. It has to change. The question is, what kind of change will your business undergo? Will it undergo crisis change, where you're, you're panicked, you have no resources, but you're just trying to do what you can to stay alive? Or reactive change, where clearly there are problems, clearly we're not the profitable company we used to be, clearly we're starting to lose people, but at least we still have some capability. Or will you undergo anticipatory change? where things are going very well, you have access to very powerful resources, and, and you want to change in this context. And the only way you can make anticipatory change is if you have leaders in your organization that are connected to your clients, that really understand your clients strategically and how their world is changing. And they can anticipate the new value that is required by these customers and you've separated your 20% of customers that really matter from the 80% that don't. And you're willing to make investments in this 20% in an anticipatory manner so that you can figure out what the new definition of value is going to be. So this means that our account managers need to understand our customers strategically. And by that we mean they need to understand what is the mission of this organization? Why do they exist? And then what are their core values? And do those values resonate with ours? Within that context then of mission and values, we need to understand their vision. Where are they going? What are they trying to achieve? What do they see in their future 5, 10, 50 years from now? And then most visions now are even just three years out, again, because the world is changing so much. But the really uh, strong companies, they, they want to, you know, what's that saying? The best way to predict the future is to invent it. So the really strong companies will have a 10 or 20 year vision and say this is, this is what we see in the future. Based on that, they'll have key areas that they need to invest in, critical success factors that they say we, we have to get this right. No company can excel in every possible area. So we're going to differentiate ourselves by making sure that we're successful in these particular areas so that we can achieve our vision. And then they'll have some sort of metric, a uh, balanced scorecard. That again, profitability is not enough. Profitability points backward. And also, it's, uh, it's easy to be profitable, very easy. I could just stop paying all my employees, and I'll be profitable for one quarter. And then they'll all quit, and then I'm in trouble. So, but at least for one quarter, I showed that I was profitable. 
So, so there's a way to be profitable that's not healthy. And so we, most organizations, healthy organizations, put in place a balanced scorecard where they're looking at other metrics beside profitability, such as employee loyalty. Uh, you know, how, how satisfied are our employees? And they'll put in other metrics as well, and, and they'll measure their executives on all of these metrics, four or five different metrics, not just profitability. Within that, then, the leaders have strategic initiatives that they have to undertake. And these usually have anywhere from a one to a three-year time frame. So within the next three years, we will uh, implement new ERP software. And that's one of my initiatives as, let's say, the CIO. Um, we, we will get into a new geographic market in, in the coming year. And that's one of my initiatives as the VP of marketing, whatever the case is. And then within those initiatives, they'll break them down into 90-day action plans. So we need our salespeople and our uh, account managers to really understand customers at this level. And understanding that these strategic factors then boil down to personal objectives. There may be a training that I have to have, or there's certain objectives that I want to reach personally in order to ensure that I can meet my strategic initiatives and my 90-day action plans. And it's when all of these are aligned that companies are able to achieve their strategic outcomes. And that's what we need to understand. What are their strategic outcomes? What are they trying to achieve? And what's interfering with what they're trying to achieve? And how can we help? So all of this is predicated on trust. The only way we can move from a stranger to a strategic ally is if there's strong trust in the relationship. And, and the way we need to define trust is buy-in. That when, when, when people trust us, it's not so much we're a good person. We, we, we need good people every day. It doesn't mean we trust them. We don't know them. But when people really buy into our objectives, when we have shared values and shared goals, this is when trust is highest. And again, this is what our account managers should be doing for us as they're interacting with our customers, is to really get us into that place where the customer knows that we, we know and we understand and we share their values and goals. And as I said in a previous uh, webinar that I did with Mile, uh, emotions are tied to goals. And so when we understand the goals of our customers, we have access to their emotional system, their emotional makeup. Anything that we do that helps them achieve their goals is going to trigger positive emotions. And anything that interferes with their goals is going to trigger negative emotions. So if we can help them achieve their goals, or we can help them eliminate the, the frustrations that are interfering with their goals, this is really the definition of value. And this is what we need to be focused on. We work with an organization called Arpedio, which has developed a platform to help organizations build account plans. And, and, and what they do is they structure, however it is you go to market, however it is you're successful engaging your customers in these five different buckets. That basically you're going to be successful with your customer when you get the relationships right, when you know who the decision makers are and you can build relationships with them and the other stakeholders. When you really understand the customer's challenges, what their goals are, what their objectives are, what their challenges are. When you understand how they make their decisions, you understand your buyer, the level of their decision making, and you're able to not just position products and services, but really understand their problems so that you can solve them with solutions, and in that way articulate value to them. It's when you get your organization understanding how to execute on this formula that you will build very strong relationships with customers. And so underneath that formula, you want to create a scorecard that you can measure, you know, if we were to break out relationships, look at different metrics that are defined for you, how you go to market and what matters to you, and get everybody in a place where they can objectively evaluate how are we doing in each of these dimensions. Look at the different stakeholders, understand each one as a human being, and, and how you can shift over time their perception of you as a valuable partner. And, and maybe it's not just you, As the, if, I'm, if I'm the account manager. I need to understand who my key resources in my organization are and how I can pair them up with the key stakeholders in the client organization. Again, this is human-to-human -human selling. This is really about building relationships. And I don't have to do all of this myself, but I have to be the one as the account manager who thinks about this and organizes it. So other elements that you want in the account plan and that in order to build these strategic relationships your account manager should have a vision and a strategy for the account. 
They should understand the customer's background, have a profile for them, understand their objectives, understand what pressures are acting on this organization, both internally and externally. What are their strategies? Do a SWOT analysis for them so you understand their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. When, they are, when you are looking at uh, internal challenges, what are the root causes of those? What's their competitive position? What are their critical success factors? How much do they spend in this area of your market? And what percentage are you getting? What's the overall financial health and where can you help? How well do you understand how, the org uh, how it's organized and the different business units? Where are you in your relationship levels with the different stakeholders? And where do you want to be? And, and, and who needs to be in front of who? What's their history of doing business with you? What's your history of creating value for them? Where, where are the opportunities to do business with this organization right now and in the future? And finally, what is the action plan? What is the game plan? And you want that game plan to be dynamic. And again, this is this platform, Arpedio, which if you're interested, I'll, I'll tell you how you can get in touch with me to talk about it. But you can automate this. And you can make it so that you can have a red light, green light, yellow light on each of these dimensions. And you can see where you're weak and where you're strong, how you can leverage your strengths, and how you can then uh, improve upon your weaknesses. But you want the account manager thinking about the account in these dimensions and then coming up with a plan which is somewhat guided based on your best practices and then executing that plan in order to build a relationship with the account. And all of that should be rolled up into what we call a heat map <clears throat> where you can look at all of your customers and you can see how are we doing across these dimensions and, and what, which customers are we likely to lose. So if it's red light, yellow light, green light, and we've got a customer where it's pretty much red across the board, it's high, we, we can anticipate we're going to lose that customer. Now what we have to ask ourselves is, is that a bad thing? Maybe it's good for us to lose this customer. Maybe this customer is more problem than they're worth. Maybe they're just not a good fit for us, and we're going to let that customer go. Or maybe this is a critical customer. This is an ideal customer. And the fact that we're red across the board is problematic. We need to sit down and we need to develop a strategy. You know, we're pretty strong in relationships. How can we strengthen those relationships with Nabisco and, and do a better job of understanding their situation? So that puts us in a better position to get into an evaluation process with them. So, so we need this ability to look at all of our accounts objectively and see exactly where we are and decide which ones are strategic and which ones are worth it investing in. So I began with this quote, and I'll, I'll end with it, to say we've got to get this kind of thinking out of our mind, that it costs five times more to acquire a customer than it does to retain one. It's simply not true. In today's world, where the customers are, their world is changing overnight, practically, their perception of value continues to change. They face new challenges. And so for us to retain that customer, we need to recognize that value is constantly migrating. Value is a moving target. And if we're going to remain relevant, we have to continue to make investments to continue to be valuable to those customers. So it might cost far more to retain a customer than it does to actually acquire them. But if they're in that 20% of clients that we call right fit clients, that can really make a, a difference to our business, that, that helping them helps us strategically, that the closer they get to their goals, the closer we get to ours, then it's worth the investment. That, that whatever investment I make in this client, they're going to reward me handsomely. And I'm going to be a far more profitable company taking that view that we are prepared to make investments for the right customer. But we need to understand who those right customers are. And again, having this sort of uh, objective ability to look at all of our accounts and see exactly where we are with these accounts, what we need to do to improve, and have a dynamic ability to plan and execute, and also a way to discern and decide which customers do we need to fire, which customers do we need to, to let go. They're just not a good fit for us and really focus on that 80%, of that 20% that generate 80% of our profitability. So I wanted to leave some time for a Q&A, so I'll stop here. And uh, in the meantime, I'll just mention that I'm happy to continue the conversation. And if you would like to have a 30-minute uh, free consultation, no obligation, uh, to talk about this and to talk about how you can actually automate 
your account planning process. I think this is an area where a lot of businesses are weak. We spend a lot of time trying to optimize the sales process. But the sales process is becoming increasingly irrelevant as the buying process takes dominance. And so now when we begin to understand that it's the buying process that takes dominance, what really matters is our ability to do account planning and account management. And a lot of that can be automated, and I'm happy to talk about that as well. Simply uh, email me, a davis at whetstoneinc.ca. We do business all over the world and uh, happy to uh, arrange a, a free consultation for you. So with that, uh, Mr. Jeffrey, I'll turn it back over to you. And uh, if we have some questions, I'm happy to uh, spend some time answering those questions. So Adrian, folks, uh, if you have any questions, you can put it in the question box. Or if you can raise your hand, I can give you an opportunity to speak to Adrian. Uh, either way, any questions? Um, or any raised hands? Okay, let me go to question box. There's a question from Antonio Almeida. How do you define value for a customer? How do we define value for a customer? Great question. Uh, because uh, a lot of people don't know how to define this. And, and what we would say is value is the benefit whatever the benefit is to the customer that outweighs the cost. So if I'm willing to spend something, and, and customers spend two things. Number one is time. They spend time in order to get benefit. And the second thing they spend is money. They spend money in order to get benefit. And, and they usually spend time first. So what we're looking for is the perception of benefit to the customer and the willingness to sacrifice something either time or money, or both, in order to obtain that benefit. That's, that's how we define value, that it's an exchange of cost for benefit. Uh, OK, Adrian, there's, there's another one, short one. How can you induce human factor in organizational culture while engaging customers, rather than purely depending on the commercial aspect of keeping customer happy. OK, I, I think I understood that, Mr. Jeffrey, but if you could just repeat the question so I can just hear it again. So then the question is, how can you introduce human factor in organizational culture while engaging customers, rather than purely depending on the commercial aspect of keeping customer happy? Yes, OK, I, I understand the question. So here, part of the answer here is going to be the, the culture of the organization. There's a saying over here that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, so, so culture is what trumps. Culture is what ultimately matters. And if the organizational culture that you work for is unhealthy, if it prioritizes profit over people, if it, if it is focused purely on commercialism, then it's going to be very difficult for you as an individual to say, you know, let's make sure we're caring about people. Let's make sure we're looking after the human being in these transactions. The, the, the culture simply will not allow for that. So I think number one is it, it has to come from the top. And, and, and from the top, there needs to be this sense that we're not in business simply to make money. There's a noble purpose behind our business. We're here to change the world in some meaningful way. And it's those businesses that actually engage in meaning and not just trying to make money, that attract the best talent. You know, talented people make money. And, and making money becomes boring after a while. And so they will leave to try to find meaning. You'll see people making tons of money leave an organization to go and do nonprofit work because their soul is crying out to do something meaningful. And it's the companies that actually satisfy the soul's need to do meaningful work with also our, our, our economic need to make money, they do the best. And so number one is uh, you need to make sure you're working for an organization that has embedded in its culture respect for people and respect for the, the human being. Secondly, now, uh, this, this shift from a supplier-driven economy 
to a buyer-driven economy is forcing all businesses to be much more respectful than they've ever been. We're, we're in a much more transparent uh, world, economic world, than we were in the past. You know, if you have value from this uh, webinar, I would ask you to, to tweet out the value that you got from the webinar and mention uh, the sales oracle. You know, this, this is an instant world where if you didn't get value and, and you feel you wasted your time, you could also do the same. You could say, oh, terrible, terrible uh, webinar from, from the sales oracle. And, and that could destroy my business overnight. So, so whether they like it or not, businesses are being forced to be much more respectful to the human being than they have in the past. In the past, they could work. You know, I, in my book, Human to Human Selling, I reference a, a, an experience that a 12-year-old child had with a massive, multi-million dollar, huge gaming company where they were promised that uh, they would get their order shipped in time for Christmas. And the, customer, the, the company kept breaking their promises to the point where they missed Christmas. And they were having this exchange over email and the supplier became very aggressive, very arrogant, very abusive to this 12-year-old child. And the 12-year-old child simply put it on social media. And somebody else picked it up, and it went viral. And it destroyed this multi-million dollar company. I think it was hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue a year. And they were destroyed practically overnight. And had to, the, the, the main perpetrator had to come back and apologize to this 12-year-old child. So even if these organizations don't have healthy culture in terms of their value system, because of the power of buyers today and the transparency that's provided through social media, everybody's having to be careful and, and to look beyond just the commercial transaction to actually creating value for people. Okay, uh, we have a caller. Let me go straight, raise the hand. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, you have raised your hand. Could you please sir, ask a question? Yeah, hi, Adrian. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I had a quick question in regards to you. You said the, the readiness of change, and uh, you talked about the anticipatory chain. So uh, don't you think, Adrian, sometimes it happens is that uh, uh, you change because the trend of business is changing, and, uh, and actually it, you, you don't require to change. Sometimes that change may uh, reduce the level of your customer satisfaction and maybe perhaps in the long term reduce your profits. So uh, in, instead of that, some, you mean to some kind of a proactive change in that or um, like can you elaborate on that? It would be great. Well, uh, Dr. Muhammad, a great, very insightful question and, and thank you for asking that. Um, I think, yes, this, this does happen and I think it happens every day where organizations are changing or quote unquote innovating but they really don't know why. And, and they're trying to innovate just to say they're innovative. Or they're trying to change because they, they sense their competitors are changing. And that's not the kind of change we mean when we talk about anticipatory change. Uh, another way we could describe uh, Dr. Muhammad anticipatory change would be to call it co-creation. That if you're, if let's say you are one of my clients and uh, we have, you know, Whetstone and your organization, we have a strategic partnership. And you are now showing me how your customers is changing. And I understand that. And then I see the new challenges that you have. And we collaborate together to figure out what new value needs to be created for your customer. You know, Henry Ford, he said, if I asked my customer um, what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. And I think that's very, very insightful. Customers don't know what they want. And we can't look to the customer to tell us, what do you want? Because we go and build that, bring it to the customer, and say, ah, I changed my mind. Uh, what, what Henry Ford did and what organizations like Apple and Google and Amazon and all these organizations do is they really get to understand their customer at a level of intimacy that surpasses all of their competitors. And it's with that deep insight that they can see what this customer needs next. And they, they, they make, they confirm, they validate their insight with the customer. And then they validate their ideas as to how to create new value with the customer. And they get the customer to 
co-invest in the co-creation process. So they're not experimenting. It's not, it's not like um, they're gambling. And, and they're hoping, uh, Dr. Muhammad, that they will come up with something that the customer will value. They're actually getting the customer to invest in the value. And, and this is what we mean by anticipatory change, that we see right from the get-go what the challenges the customer is having, and we validate with that, that with the customer, and we get the customer to put their money where their mouth is, up front, and to invest in this, in this process. We have one of our customers that, that calls this process blueprinting, and they go through a blueprinting process with the customer. And investment is required from the customer up front before any innovation is done. I, I, is, is that uh, answering the question, uh, Dr. Muhammad? Yeah, yeah, that's true. From you actually right from the customer's perspective, perspective, yeah, that's co-creation is there where you can think of a backward integration or the forward integration where yeah. you can think of some collaborating with your suppliers or you are thinking like uh, being for manufacturing, you go to the retailing. So that's perhaps yeah, I understand from customer point of view, uh, you are absolutely right. That co-creation can be a good thing. Thanks for your insight. I appreciate that. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ali, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you indeed, Dr. for the question. Uh, and let me move to the question box. We can take one last question. Supplementary. Uh, usually sales do not want to say no because another competitor will say yes. How to deal with the dilemma effici efficiently? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, having been in sales uh, most of my career, I'll say that I've absolutely seen that over and over and over again, both when I was in the field as a practitioner and now as a consultant working with sales teams. Um, first of all, that approach lacks integrity. It lacks integrity, and customers can smell it. When, when they're dealing with a salesperson that constantly says yes, they're, they're going to have a feeling of uneasiness. Thirdly, if you cannot say no, it says you have no strategy. When, when you have a strategy, you have clarity. And when you have clarity, some things fit that strategy and some things don't. So I, I think it's a very, very dangerous road to go down. And, and often we see this in early stage companies as well. The entrepreneurial company, that's a software company, and the client is asking, do they wash windows? And they never say no, you know, because they need money. But what we need more than money are great customers, great relationships. And, and if we say yes, you know, we're working with a client right now, and they're, they're implementing uh, Jim Collins' um, good to great and uh, the hedgehog, hedgehog principle. But one of, the, one of the core principles of this is uh, find out what you're deeply passionate about and what you can be best in the world at. And so they're now asking their salespeople to answer this question. Does this fit in, in the kind of work that we do? Will, will we be passionate about this project? And equally important, is this something we can be world class at doing? If we can't be world class at doing this, say no and refer them to somebody else. And, and because of this approach, they are gaining incredible momentum in their market. In fact, they're dwarfing their competitors. And some of their biggest suppliers, uh, they, they deal with the HPs and, and the IBMs and the large, large um, vendors, technology vendors, as their suppliers. These suppliers are, are now coming to them and saying, can you help us win this account? Because of the reputation that they're building in the marketplace and the, the incredible traction that they're gaining in the marketplace. So I think um, basically the message is to salespeople who can never say no is stop or you're fired because you're not helping anybody. We, we need salespeople who can go in and, and really understand our customers or understand our prospects and, and maybe challenge our customers and our prospects to think in new ways about their, their issues and their opportunities and to be very clear about what we do and what we don't do and find projects that are going to be profitable for us but also where we can shine and deliver great value. And that's the new world. And if we're not living in that world, I don't think we're going to survive much longer. I think that we're in such a transparent world today that if you're not doing great work, everybody's going to hear about it. And if you are doing great work, everybody's going to hear about it. Well, thank you very much, Adrian. That really brings us. I'll, I'll 
stop there and let this. Yeah, that really brings us towards the end of the webinar, Adrian. And I would like to thank you on behalf of Mile for this wonderful presentation. Any concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss out? Uh, no, I just remind uh, everyone again, I'd love to continue the conversation, and my email address is there on the screen, adavis at weststoneinc.ca. Um, and, and maybe I'll just, anytime you hear that saying, that it costs more to acquire a customer than it does to retain one, I would say that that comes from people who are careless about their retention strategy. And, and what, what the, main, the fundamental message that I have is it really does require investment to retain customers. So be careful about which customers you're selecting and which ones you're investing in. Because if you make those decisions, if you make good decisions at that level, you can really significantly grow your business. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share this message with your community. Thanks for having me. And thank you indeed for accepting the offer to do this webinar with us. And folk, we are recording this webinar, which will be uploaded on my community. I've already shared a link on your webinar console at the bottom of the chat box from where you can download the soft copy of the presentation, which Adrian illustrated in this webinar today. Once again, Adrian Davis, thank you very much for your time, and thank you all of those who participated in this. Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, MILE.